want to welcome everyone to Let's Think Your Way to Next, this new bi-weekly series. This is the first one to envision what's next, preparing and opening our minds to what's possible. Today, we're joined by Walter Burbrick from um, the Naval War College, Allison Inglesby, a design thinking facilitator, and Todd Knapp, owner of Envision Technology Advisors, and will be moderated and led by Jen Silbert, the co-founder of Spartina Consulting. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Jen. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who jumped in. Um, we, uh, I'm, I'm here in my home office where there will be dogs in the background and kids upstairs taking classes. So interruptions are likely. Um, I share that because we really want you to come as you are um, and, and be a part of a conversation. I, I do, my name is Jen Silbert. I um, co-founded Sportina Consulting with my husband, um, goodness, almost a decade ago. And we really are passionate about growing future leadership um, from the strengths up. So um, facilitating conversations like these is a true passion of mine. Um, I'm really excited to welcome Walter, Allison, and Todd, all of whom our paths have crossed in one way or another. Um, what I want to just a quick um, reminder of why we're really here, and it's really a threefold purpose. We're here to create community. Very simply, we want to connect. We want to relate. We want to um, we want to pave the future now. Um, into next. Um, we're also here to create a ray of hope, like to really spark ideas of what else could be in ways that we can't think about alone. Um, and then lastly, we really want to inspire coordinated action. Like what is it we're learning today that we're going to take out of this call that'll give it life well beyond a, a mere Zoom screen. So give that some thought as you, as you engage with your panelists today. Um, I'm going to ask some questions to our three guest panelists uh, for about a half hour, and then we're going to do a breakout where you'll have the opportunity to interact with the panelists and with each other. Um, and then we'll pull it all back together before, before 11. All right, great. game on, everyone in? Game on. So, um, I wanna start this first question off and Walt, I'm gonna look at you, especially given your experience with gaming and studying history at the Naval War College. Um, and let's take a look at um, leadership. So considering leaders near and far, um, that you most admire right now in this chapter, okay? So from your perspective, what leadership qualities do you think are gonna really prevail, even thrive in what's mm -hmm. next? Sure, thanks, Jen. And uh, first, thank, thanks for the invitation. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. And thanks to, uh, to everyone who's joining us for this conversation uh, you know, during these difficult times. Um, my, my wife and I, Lori, hope uh, you're safe and well. And you know, if you, if you know someone who uh, if you've lost someone or you know someone who's sick uh, with the virus or if you're like many Rhode Islanders or small businesses suffering economic hardship, you know, know that you're not alone and know that you're not it uh, and that we're all in this together. Because um, really now is the time for us to come together as, as neighbors, as co-workers, as fellow Rhode Islanders. Um, and over these past few weeks, it's, and they've been long, uh, we've seen so many acts of, uh, of courage and kindness um, blown away by our, our healthcare workers on the front lines. We're grateful to our public servants. Uh, but, you know, what I've learned, and I think what we've learned throughout history uh, during times of great crisis, it's that, you know, looking out for one another doesn't, ex uh, doesn't end in our homes and our schools and our places of worship, but it really does extend to business and government uh, at every level. Uh, and that kind of leadership that's guided by kind of three big things that I'll, I'll, I'll touch on today. And that's really knowledge and experience, honesty and humility and, and vision and courage. And I think that's how we adapt and overcome. Uh, that's how we uh, can think our way and act our way to next. And really, it doesn't matter really at any level, right? If you're a mayor or the president or if you're a seaman or an admiral, if you're a small mom and pop's business, uh, like, a, like my own family restaurant or a Fortune 500 company, uh, leaders real leaders, I think, are forged in crisis. Uh, and leaders become real when they practice a few key behaviors or traits. Uh, and they inspire people during tough times. And the situation that we find ourselves in today uh, is changing day, day by day and changing by the hour. Uh, but, the, but the best leaders can really quickly assimilate and process information quickly, right? And I think that's one of the big key things to, to, to being knowledgeable they can rapidly determine kind of what matters most and they can make decisions with conviction. And I often think about, you know, from my time as a Naval officer to my work at the Red, in the Red Cross here across Rhode Island, and even, even as an educator at the War College, I've seen what happens when good people kind of prioritize precision over speed. Um, and, in, and you think, reflect on history, right? And I'm reminded of uh, FDR's famous quote, right? That he gave 
in his inaugural address at the height of the Great Depression. And it's an infamous quote that all of us know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Uh, but what really, what, what was interesting in that, what he followed, and he pointed to our nation's strength um, in meeting the crisis, where he said that no, uh, that this is no unsolvable problem. And we, if, if we face it wisely and, and courageously, uh, and there are many ways it, it can be helped, but uh, it can never be helped by just talking about it. We got to act and we got to act quick. So during a crisis as a leader, you're overwhelmed with so much information and information is late. It's incomplete. It's inaccurate. Uh, so the, and the interests and priorities of people and organizations uh, clash, emotions and anxiety run high. So as a leader, right, analysis paralysis is real, right? You can freeze up, but you can avoid it, I think, by do, doing a couple of things. And the first is really just prioritizing what matters to you most. Uh, and if you think about it, at this stage of the crisis, you know, for a business that could very much include, you know, customer or employee safety and care, it could be financial liquidity, it could be operational continuity. Um, the other thing, right, as leaders, you have to make smart trade-offs, right, between survival today and success tomorrow. We're seeing that play out right now, right, closing our doors today so that we can open them tomorrow. Uh, and I really found that the best leaders one, you know, understand that mistakes will be made, uh, take responsibility for their own and don't punish people for, for actually making them. Uh, Cause we're all human, we're all make mistakes. And this is a time where we're gonna learn and grow. Um, and part of that is being honest. And that's really that second, that trait I mentioned, uh, honest with yourself, with your employees, your teammates, your boss, your leaders. And I think strong leaders, smart leaders, uh, right? They seek in input from a number of different sources. Um, they're not afraid to, to to say that they don't know something, they're not afraid to bring out in outside experts. Uh, and that's what allows good leaders to take calculated risks. Um, so it's understanding not only what to do, but what not to do. Uh, and so that's, that's the world we live in, uh, in the War Gaming Department at the War College. Uh, for example, I recall a game uh, that I was involved with a few years back where we had the actual commander of uh, America, uh, the Pacific Fleet. And uh, he decided not to take a particular course of action he decided not to execute a particular plan because it likely would provoke a certain response. And, and he, a response that he observed while participating in a game the year before. Uh, and that it's that same knowledge um, would be expressed by Admiral Nimitz who had that same job during World War II. And in a letter that he inked to the president of the War College at that time, it's in a letter I, I walk by every day at work, he wrote, you know, the war against Japan was gained at the Naval War College in so many ways with so many people that really nothing was a surprise except the kamikaze attacks. They hadn't envisioned them. They hadn't anticipated them. So a big part of leadership is learning. Uh, and it really, if you're looking for role models today, I think, you know, um, in terms of seeing it play out right now is you, you can turn to, you know, Governor Cuomo of New York or even our own governor here in Rhode Island. Uh, both, I think, are offering, you know, free graduate level courses on uh, on crisis leadership, right? They lay out the facts, they explain the gravity of the situation, they outline the resources, they outline what we need and what's already deployed, and they, and they really call upon the people to, to act with compassion. So um, whether it's in business or in government, really, I think the, the way we can think our way to next, and we can't do it without really staying true to our values, and that's especially during in times of crisis. Um, and it's in times like this where we're reminded, right, honesty matters, leadership matters, and, and honest leadership matter. Um, and I think that's really what's going to help us uh, think our way to next. Thank you. I will never, I've been sharing with um, colleagues recently how I will never take for granted the sense of calm and confidence I gain from watching my local leaders at the governor level and municipal level um, and, and the, 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 the real sacredness of, of that confidence and sense of calm watching them. Um, I want to turn it up. Go ahead, Walter. Well, I, actually, I, I, Jennifer, do, do you mind if I ask Walter a quick question? Please. Is that, is that part of the, is that part of the, the uh, structure of this thing? Uh, <laughs> no structure. Plan well, hang loose. Go for it. Right. So, Walter, I, I guess I, I would ask you this question because I have to imagine it's got to be on a few people's minds. I mean, this is sort of the frank conversation here, right? There, one of the, the pieces of language I've heard repeated a lot in this event is your health is my health. My neighbor's health is my health, right? Um, how do we – how, how would you suggest that people process it 
when they're faced with somebody that's in a leadership position that isn't exhibiting the qualities that you just described. Whereas a community, we're responsible together for getting through this together, and we've got somebody in our community who just isn't taking these kinds of approaches and isn't isn't displaying good leadership. How would you how would you think people ought to process that and interact yeah. with that? Yeah, a good question. I think at a very basic level, you know, just um, and we're seeing it play out. It's it's and we're and we're all leaders in this respect. And it's again, it's thinking about knowledge and being honest. And it's it's as simple as wearing masks. You know, going in, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you'd probably see a couple of people wearing masks in a, in a, in a supermarket. But as the day has gone on, uh, without the restrictions um, and executive orders in place, people gradually did it to the point where you felt out of place not wearing a mask, right? So I think part of it is leading by example. And I think that's a big piece to, to leadership. And, um, and sometimes, right, and for me personally, you know, it, it felt co uncomfortable wearing a mask. Um, but over time, it, it, it became comfortable because I knew it was the right thing to do. I found myself with the masks, I, I was struggling because I wasn't making eye contact that first weekend. And then, then I became the creeper who was like smiling with her eyes as best as she could, just to make sure connection was happening. I wanna um, throw a question at um, Allison, our design thinking guru in the room. Um, and we've had conversations, Allison, in recent uh, days and weeks about written and unwritten rules. So um, given what you're seeing here and what you hope to see going forward, what are the new written or unwritten rules you aspire to see on the other side of next, both in the context of your work, your design thinking work, um, mm -hmm. but even well beyond? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I'm really excited to be here and love um, engaging with Venture Cafe anytime I can um, and happy to meet some new people. So I th um, thinking about what's next, you know, um, as a design thinker, um, being nimble and flexible and embracing ambiguity is all part of um, the whole framework. And so here we are, we're finding ourselves in um, a forced disruption. And so really the design thinking mindsets lend themselves to really help uh, manage and navigate um, what we're all experiencing. And so there's a lot of opportunity to um, to embrace what we're going through and to try new things. And so my hope toward next is, um, is that people are more open and maybe break out of the, the tracks that we all find ourselves in for whatever reason, um, time, budget, um, personnel. There always seems to be a lot of obstacles up that make it uh, people reluctant to try something new. We don't have the time, we can't do that. But now, you know, everything is up in the air. So what better time than to try some new things? Um, you know, design thinking, I left a whole career of education um, when I started design thinking about five years ago because it resonated so loudly with me and it's a framework that works across the board for anyone, mm -hmm. for students, for CEOs, for anyone in between. And it resonated loudly with me because it's rooted in empathy. And so here we have this incredible framework that's rooted in empathy and uh, collaboration, um, diversity of ideas and perspectives. Everyone's got a, an equal voice. And again, at this time, we're finding ourselves, we need to be banding together. And um, the sense of community, um, you know, is just really underscored, whether the community is um, within a company or a, broad, a community group, um, just allowing people to have a voice and to be part of the solution. And, um, so I would love to see leaders be more open to experimentation and, and allow their employees to try things without the fear of failure, because really it's about learning. Um, I think we've seen so many companies who have pivoted over the past few weeks um, 
who are starting to, you know, uh, different distilleries who are making hand sanitizer, you know, they did a really fast pivot to do that. If you'd asked them a month or two ago, hey, why don't you, you know, would you think about making hand sanitizer? I don't think that they would have thought that was a good idea. But here they found themselves in a situation and they were able to pivot. So I hope that companies see that, you know what, maybe there, it's time to rethink how we're doing things, um, create some new opportunities, look for opportunity. There's always some opportunity um, in uh, a shakeup, in, dis in a crisis to be found. And, and what's there? And what can we do to improve and move forward? I think it's especially important at a time where we are filled with so much uncertainty and we really are going week to week, day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one thing to wait for next, but it's another thing to write the next chapter. Mm -hmm. um, I was on a call with a client um, just last night, last yesterday afternoon, where they were sharing how they, were, they weren't tasked by their supervisor to host these virtual um, workshops um, to really support their HR leaders. And yet on their own inspired volition, they did. And they're getting more return on that investment in mm -hmm. the last two weeks than they did for six months worth of programming that they had invested thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in. Um, and it's an opportunity for almost the mea culpa to survive, right? I didn't ask permission. I showed up and if it didn't work, oh well. But now that's the right. That's uh, right. And maybe there's something new that comes out of that. And it certainly has strengthened and given confidence to those employees and that team. Um, and, you know, building a culture, you, um, you know, how might we rethink the office? Think of all the things that have just been completely turned upside down. And it's a time for everyone to take stock. And um, to what Walter said, you know, what are our priorities? And, and what, what's working well? Um, what did we find? What's new here that we can incorporate into what we're doing? And how can we move forward and not be afraid to try things and, and, and be um, confident whether or not it works out? But the fact that we're trying and, and making efforts. Um, you know, in design thinking, it's a bias toward action. So, and that has to come from the top. The, the leadership, you know, back to leadership, um, good leaders will give permission to their teams to, to try. And, um, you know, again, that is going to be part of a strong team and a strong culture. And that pays dividends over, over the long haul as well. Absolutely. In fact, culture is a great segue for um, a question I want to lob over to Todd, um, who's the founder and CEO of Vision Technology Advisors here in Rhode Island. Um, Todd, you and I have been talking a lot about the difference between a leader being able to, and, and an organization being able to build culture when you're in the shared space, physical space, co-located. Something as simple as grabbing a cup of coffee or, or water cooler talk being able to give that thumbs up or that smile to a colleague spontaneously, instantaneously, whereas you don't have that luxury now. Um, so let's talk about for you what the thoughtful culture building you're doing here and now with Envision. And in, given the loss of that incidental interaction among your colleagues, among your team, um, what steps are you deliberately taking to build and fortify your company culture? As especially as it relates to honoring very human needs, not just business needs. Yeah, so <laughs> this is a, it's a topic that I am incredibly passionate about. Um, you know, I, yes, I am a technology professional. That's the industry I've been in for a long time. But um, I have always jokingly and lovingly said that I'm, I'm one of the, I'm an unusual technology professional and that I don't always love my industry. Um, because one of the reasons that a lot of us get into technology is because we're not always wonderful at dealing with human beings. And uh, we just love that computer to person interaction, you know. Um, but uh, I think that, I think that, you know, we've done a pretty good job over the years at, at Envision of trying to find ways to redefine that. And this for the last two years, I have been speaking all over the country on the topic of digital transformation and, and how, what role video can play, what role communication, like what we're doing right now with Venture Cafe can play. 
this is a phenomenal tool that we've got at our, at our disposal and we're using it at unprecedented levels right now. But you're right. I mean, what you and I were talking about, Jen, is that we have lost something as well. And we have to be very conscious of that. You know, I, I have had zero conference calls with my employees since we began um, this event. Everything we do is face to face. It's all video. And, you know, we use Microsoft Teams. We've been in Teams almost since the product was first released. We were very early adopters. So we've been using it for years now. Um, but one of the things that I became acutely aware of in this is the loss of in incidental interaction. When I walk through my office and I see somebody across the room and I'm headed to the water cooler, I'm not going to see that individual. I'm headed to the water cooler. We lock eyes across the room for milliseconds, measured in milliseconds. And I, I throw a smile, I get one back. That whole thing is a conversation. And the conversation was, I see you and I recognize your value and I'm happy that you're here. And that smile back is, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm here too. And we just validated each other. We just told each other that we matter to each other. And so when we do things like build culture online, one of the things we have to recognize is that those opportunities for inter incidental interaction are few and far between. Every interaction I have with my employees is because I deliberately reached out to them or they deliberately reached out to me. And I think that you know, if we could actually do the math, you know, which I think is probably impossible, but if we could, I think what we'd learn is that in a given day in an office, you literally have hundreds of these in incidental interactions and that your trust in your colleagues and in your company is built on a lattice framework of, of hundreds of tiny micro interactions on a daily basis that tell you that you're part of community. And so, you know, one of the things that Jen and I were talking about is, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, um, you know, Maslow's hierarchy. And, you know, I, one of the things I did as we began this whole event was I sat down and I was thinking about Maslow and I was thinking, okay, these are my human needs at the lowest level physiological needs, air, food, water, shelter, sleep. If those needs aren't met, I can't think about anything above that. That's the, the fundamental precept of Maslow. And then I started to think, if I had to map a company's Maslow needs, what would they look like? At the lowest level, market, market demand and an ability to, to deliver. And as you move up the stack, we need tool sets that capable people can use to do their jobs. But does that build, does that meet the love and belonging need? For that, we really need culture. We need trust. And that piece right there is the piece that I think is most at risk in this moment, because when we are separated, we don't have those, those hundreds of tiny opportunities. Mm -hmm. And actually in a conversation with my own team, we were talking about this and somebody said to me, Hey, Todd, you know, you're missing something else in there. There's something else that's lost too. And I said, what's that? And he said, this is actually my marketing director. It was a very insightful comment. He said, uh, you're missing the opportunity in a, in a setting like this to do good things, charitable things for the people around you. It could be something simple like holding a door open for somebody or, oh, that water bottle looks heavy. Let me help you put that on the water cooler. Those opportunities to be charitable and to show someone, demonstrate through your actions that you care about them in unexpected and unrequested ways is how we build culture and love and belonging. And, you know, recognition, the ability for the company to be recognized for the good works it's doing and the ability for the company to recognize its employees for the good works that they're doing are how we get to that esteem level. And then of course, self-actualization, achieving somebody's full potential in a business context might mean for a company that it is a profitable company and doing something valuable. So I think one of the things we have to do as leaders and business leaders in the community right now is we need to be looking at all layers of Maslow and saying, okay, whatever's next, how do I map what I'm gonna redesign my business and my culture and my community to be to ensure that I am aligning it with the various levels of Maslow that my people need. I wonder, I really wonder how many new, how many new um, diagnoses of, uh, 
of you know agoraphobia we're going to see following this event mm -hmm. you know there is institutional memory here and institutional trauma that has occurred here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right we have all been traumatized at some level our safety has been threatened and it's been threatened unfortunately by something that we can't point at and say this is the bad actor it's not a person that did this it's not a foreign government it's not it's not a militant body this is our planet <laughs> Right. And so, you know, we have to figure that out and we need to be conscious of that for our people. I think that's really an important dynamic to consider. Uh, I just actually posted in the, in the chat for everyone, which by the way, we encourage everyone to use the chat, whether you're reacting or posing additional questions. Um, but there's a link that just came out yesterday from the Barrett Value Center. What Barrett does is they take Maslow's hierarchy of needs and they, they build upon it and they've even created cultural values assessments. You can take a personal values assessment for free and they just launched their global COVID-19 um, culture assessment, which they're inviting everyone to complete by early May. And it's along these very lines, Todd, of how are we really acknowledging the, where we are on that hierarchy of needs and what are we doing about it um, as individuals, but more importantly, as organizations and as communities really thinking our way to next. Um, I wanna make sure we honor uh, any other questions from the group in response to Todd's conversation here. It's not easy to get deliberate when you have the need for spontaneous conversations that have to be scheduled on a Zoom or in a text or whatnot, and yet making the time to be super mindful of those needs and how you can create that structure, I think is really powerful. You know, Jen, it, yeah. it just uh, for whatever it's worth, I mean, one way to create those incidental opportunities is to create moments of opportunity for interaction that weren't scheduled. And, an and a, it's a really simple example, but a couple times a week randomly, I don't ever tell anyone when I'm gonna do it. Um, I start a Teams meeting at 8.30 in the morning and I post into our, in our general company-wide channel, hey guys, I'm having coffee, I'm in this room. If you wanna hang out, feel free to join me. And, you know, and I literally it says right in there, like, no work talk, we're just hanging out. And in a half an hour, I'll get 40% of the staff that will come in, go out, come back. You know, people are joking, talking about what's going on. We're showing each other our pets. You know, kids are waving into cameras. And we're just getting that opportunity to be together without mm -hmm. deliberate action. And it's just one example, but it's, it's something that can be done. That's fantastic. Easily. By the way, this is a perfect uh, topic to design think. Yeah. Finally, oh, yeah. brainstorm all the different ways and go through the process. Maybe um, that yeah, Alice, special. Allison, you're going to be hearing from me after this, no question. There's going to be, yeah. I'm thinking about you. Well, <laughs> we I've, had to we pivot. I've had to pivot too because with design thinking, the whole energy of everyone being together is so powerful and how it brings the team together is unbelievable oh and by the way you solve some problems too but it, a lot of it i saw was the the actual culture and the, the team coming together um, but i had to pivot and i've resisted virtual brainstorming and uh i've become the queen of virtual brainstorming now because i needed to i needed to pivot myself um, it's doable, but you know, it, there's nothing to replace that in-person energy and connection. Um, and I, I can't wait to get back to that. But in the meantime, I think we all do the best we can and learn as we're going along and uh, support one another. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, just a quick follow up on that. You know, I think we're seeing that play out right now with in our educational system, mm -hmm. you know, from the elementary level to the, the college level or education systems are, are forcing to are forced to adapt and um and to and to supplement those interactions those in-class interactions um you know my own kids uh, both of which are in elementary school um i think that the, their most their favorite thing of the day is, is zoom in the morning with the rest of their uh, with the rest of their peers and so but you're right being able to try to find ways to, to supplement that and even you know through facebook chat and messenger and things like that but uh, I found that they've talking, they're talking more to their their friends um, via chat now than at any point uh, before. Well, I mean, it's you know, it's it's amazing 
when you think about how people learn and how people collaborate and, you know, to Allison's point, I mean, we've all heard that phrase, like the energy in the room was amazing. Well, there is no energy in the room anymore. And when, and especially with children, you know, cause I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to help my people who have kids. And we've got a couple ideas that are longer term things that we're playing around with right now, but you know, children and adults, by the way, you know, we have neurons in our brain called mirror neurons and mirror neurons fire when we recognize similarities. And those could be similarities in behavioral actions, in communication, in speech and language. They can even fire um, sometimes because of smell. Um, but it's how we learn from each other. And so especially for children, that's really tough not having that. One of my employees actually said to me that he thinks that his child might potentially be more traumatized by trying to do what they're doing now than she would have been had they just canceled the balance of the school year because her self-confidence is being damaged every day because for her, she's not learning real well in a tele model. And so he's like, you know, she was a great student and thriving in school. And I'm watching her self-confidence be eroded every single day. Mm -hmm. It's easy to recognize in children. It's harder to recognize in adults because we hide it and our yeah. employees and our colleagues will hide it. So we yeah. have to be actively trying to tease that out and recognize it and catch it before it becomes endemic. That's a good point. I think that the, the challenges and the successes are, um, almost competing for attention in this new yeah. era. Um, the inequities that are surfacing um, are, be, are mind blowing and excruciating. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, um, there are innovations and um, why not, how come we didn't think of this sooner that are happening all over the place, um, like a groundswell. Um, I'm, my daughters are, happen to be thriving in an online learning platform. Um, where social anxiety isn't an obstacle to success anymore. Um, right. And so there's so much to be gained. You know, you were just, you just made a, a comment that I, I'm curious about your opinion on. You know, when you think about, you mentioned gaps. When you think about the gaps in the employment marketplace that have existed in the past, um, whether those have been, you know, gaps because of gender difference or mm -hmm. racial bias, you know, mm -hmm. I was thinking about what do we think those are going to look like? How will those shift following this event? And I was thinking about ageism and I was thinking about more senior employees that, you know, maybe are going to start seeing some bias because their technical skill set for doing this kind of thing might not be as, uh, as sharp as their younger counterparts. Yep. There's some new risk for us from an employment bias point of view. Inclusion and diversity are taking on a, a, the biggest mm -hmm. challenges ever, and that bewilders and excites me. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge to, to, to chase. So this is the part, my motto, as I maybe have shared at the beginning of, um, of the call, is plan well, hang loose. We had some questions we wanted to throw at our panelists and to throw in breakouts. And this is the part where we'd like to hear from you all. So um, we have about seven minutes left, maybe a little less. Um, who would like to share a, a reflection or maybe even a question um, for the group? I find that a lot of my clients claim to be experiencing Zoom fatigue. And I think especially when you have long-winded people who take forever to say things and feeling like you're constantly on camera, I just wonder how some of you are navigating that and what kind of feedback you are getting from staff related to that. Well, I think, I think the nature of our meetings have changed, even something like you know, this event and events like it. Uh, I know and a lot of venture cafes events, you know, you've shortened you know, the time that one person is speaking just because the, the virtual attention span is probably a little bit different. Um, you know, and it's a different dynamic when you're seeing people speak, whether it be a panelist or someone giving a presentation, you know, they're not able to really move around the room as much. They're in this little two and a half inch box on your screen. So, you know, Toonie mentioned in our breakouts that, that she's been doing uh, her one-to-ones twice a week for a half hour rather than a full hour. And, you know, she mentioned that that gives her more touch points, but I also think just having 
shorter meetings and spreading them out, I think can, can help with something like that as well, just to, you know, so that people aren't just sitting and looking at a screen, looking at themselves, looking at everybody else for hours at a time. Barbara, I'll give you two thoughts also that we do at Envision. Um, number one, and this is, this is my advice to everybody on the call that is trying to work remotely, resist the urge to invite everybody to your meeting just because you can. Smaller meetings are better when we talk about video interaction. Um, number two, um, don't underestimate the power of pre-recorded messaging. Um, I do my staff updates. When this started, I was doing a staff update every single week for our employees so that they knew where my head was at and what we were doing for the business. I only did two of them live. The rest of them I recorded using, the so using my video software here, similar to Zoom, and then I posted them in Teams and let people watch them when they were ready when they had the mental bandwidth and the interest. And I also put a summary of here are the subjects that were covered. And the last evolution of it was I started putting time indexes. If what you're interested in is this, go to this point in the video. And I think that helps to reduce some of that fatigue. I wanna do a shout out to my leadership Rhode Island colleague, Luann. Both Luann and Walter and I graduated, and Barbara, in fact, if there's others I'm missing, I'm gonna scan the room. Um, Luann did a really great workshop last week on um, really related to marketing um, in this very new age. And one of the things I've observed in her tips that she shared is about video and keeping it real and raw. Like this is not the era of fancy schmancy, get your hair did, have the right background, but this is a, an, an era of, of really keeping it real. Um, mm -hmm. Luann, you wanna share anything about that? <clears throat> yeah, that, so, I, so the, the feeling that I have is that we have to connect in that visual way, especially as, as you were saying earlier, Jen, we're wearing masks, it's hard to see each other out in person. So the more we can connect on video, um, the better. And also that the goal is not to look perfect. The goal is to see each other and to see the humans on the other side of the screen. And video is just really effective in that way. So not letting sort of your, how you look or your environment affect that, but just be there and be yourself. And uh, we're just going to be so happy to see you anyway. Absolutely. Any other questions, comments, folks want to share? I think to the point of, you know, of being real, I actually really like when kids come along, when dogs and cats come along, those are my favorite parts of the video where we get to see, you know, just something that we wouldn't usually see, right? You're not going to see uh, your, your, your four-year-old kid come walking up when we're in a in-person meeting, but it's just, it's some fun levity for, you know, for, for the day. Have you seen that the service that is uh, allowing companies to rent a goat to add to their Zoom meeting? <laughs> yeah, this is an actual that, thing. Yeah. yeah, this is an actual thing. Bigger companies are starting to do that to add some kind of some kind of emotional break into the meeting. Is you wow. they literally add a a camera and there's a goat on cam just like <laughs> you know like that's welcome to the meeting. <laughs> my wife wants to own a goat, so I think I don't know that we're in the renter's market right now in terms of my house, but <laughs> what's the cost of that? Oh, that's brilliant. Barbara, I think that's one of those solutions for your Zoom fatigue. You need to run a, run a Zoom. <laughs> there you go. You're set. <laughs> Golden. You have a Zoom petting zoo. There was a question earlier, and I think she ended up jumping off. This is for Allison around um, some kind of intro level design thinking books and um, reading materials for those who are interested in getting into, into that mindset. Oh, so um, some of my favorite um, resources are IDEO. Um, they've got all sorts of great resources and the D School at Stanford. And I'm glad I put this out. Designing Your Life is a great book. Um, it's, you can use it for yourself, but it's the same framework and you can use it for, um, you know, to understand the the principles and to walk yourself through it. And you could also apply it to um, something you're doing at work. So those are my favorite. In Thank fact, you. shout out to Allison. She did a great workshop last week on mural. So going back to Barbara's question about how do we prevent the fatigue, find other online tools. Like it's 
online canvases, virtual whiteboards, if you will, for co-creating and, and exchanging. So you're not just on the camera um, interacting. I've been nose diving into Mural, um, Miro, um, um, Prezi, um, a host of other spaces for just spicing it up. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that brings us right about to time. Um, so I wanna, before we close the session, I need to do a, a big shout out to the planning team that brought all this together. And it's a really powerful and fun uh, partnership between Venture Cafe, Providence, um, my friends at Trilix, Bridge Technical Talent and Tech Collective, and my company, Spartina Consulting, um, where we came together and said, okay, these are really fun conversations between the five of us, but how do we make this open to the public? So thank you to Venture Cafe for giving us that medium to do that. The last thing I want to say is happy Earth Day, people. Um, <laughs> if there's any way to lead our way into next, it's to really honor Earth Day and the leaders we all, every single person on this call and beyond is capable of, of becoming and being here and now, not waiting for the other side. So with that, um, have a wonderful day. And Avi, any other closing words? Um, can't thank you enough for your time, folks. Thank you so much. And to reiterate something you were alluding to, this is a bi week, this is a bi weekly series. So in two weeks, you will be back here with a whole new group of folks to uh, continue the conversation. Nice. Thank you guys very awesome. much for including Great. me also. Thanks, I really everyone. Appreciate it.